Hey everybody, welcome back to Team Brothership. I am joined here again, I'm, I'm Mike, joined here again by Brian. Oh boy, are we getting a lot of like road sounds and things? Oh good. I don't, I don't hear anything. Okay, I'm, I just told Brian before the show that I'm recording on my porch, which is like super dicey because it's like right at street level and my neighbors can come up and chat and things. So we'll see, we'll see how this works, but I thought it was slightly less dingy than my, my office. I, I feel like uh, you should welcome the, a, any visitors as co-hosts and they come up, they knock on the door, you open it on camera and say, <laughs> What do you know about retro horror? And if they say nothing, then you get the fuck. <laughs> well, you can my, that. My, my, little, uh, my little neighbor does play video games, so if he stops by, he can talk about, um, what did he say he played the other day? Lego. Halloween Fortnite costumes. <laughs> yeah, no, he played some Lego, some Lego game. I can't remember which one, but... Yeah, anyway, so welcome back. We're doing another Talking About Retro episode today, and um, I was chatting with Brian the other day, and I said, building off of kind of our last episode, I, I have more things that I want to say about retro retro horror, So, and I know Brian does, because that's kind of your, like, meat and potatoes. Yeah, I, I skip the potatoes. It's just, it's strictly meat. That is it, and there's no side dishes. It's just all <laughs> horror all the time. Um, it, it's it's bad too. Like it, it affects it affects what I think of non horror games. I swear. Like it's like playing a regular old game and be like, man, this game would be so much better if it was horror themed. <laughs> um, yeah, good stuff though, man. Good stuff. Like, I, and I was I was trying to think about, um, you know, uh, I was trying to think about this episode today, earlier today, planning for it as I always do so vigorously, and uh, and, and I was just thinking about like you know games that i was playing a long time ago like you know the, like some of the first games i remember playing uh and 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 sort of just they're always being this draw towards horror uh even though as a kid you know i thought things like maniac mansion was, was horror um which you know clearly it's supposed to be more of a, a tongue-in-cheek kind of like funny campy kind of uh kind of game but um you know i took it real seriously as a kid because i didn't get the jokes which, I mean, 44-year-old me doesn't get the joke either, so that's not a lot's changed. But I was going to ask you, Mike, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you had a, a different structure for the show, but like, I was kind of curious, like, with Maniac Mansion sort of being that seminal game uh, of my, my childhood, like, do you remember like, the earliest horror games you were playing? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, and I will say, you can microwave a hamster in Maniac Mansion, and sure as, as an animal lover, that's pretty horrific to me, so that, <laughs> that's horrifying. Um, yeah, I, I was like a really sensitive kid. I feel like I've mentioned that before on other episodes of the show. Like I, I got scared very easily. Like I had a hard time getting through like movies and things. Um, but my dad always talks about how he took me to see, it must've been like a re-showing of, um, Disney Snow White in theaters when I was like really little. And as, I gotta say, Mike, before you even explain this, this was not the title movie title i thought you were going to bring up when discussing this I, i'm thinking to myself did he see the exorcist when he was really oh you know, like, no when i was no. little i saw snow yeah and white and the, <laughs> the, and the witch was too much for me like i couldn't wow. i couldn't deal with it so yeah i was very sensitive i like i wouldn't even be in the room with like horror stuff when i was when i was little so a lot I, of a lot of my like early exposure to horror would be um you know, kind of like the, the Maniac Mansion kind of stuff, like the horror comedy. Like, I remember, um, nobody ever talks about it now, but I feel like when I was a little kid, everybody that I knew had a copy of Monster Party, except for me, on the NES. And, um, you know, definitely like a silly game, although, like, you know Monster Party, right? You've played that yeah, before. Yeah, of course. Like, the bit, so you're going through, like, the first level, and you're, you know, fighting all the little goofy-looking monsters, and it's kind of, like, cheerful, and there's, like, the, the Mario, like, bushes with face on, faces on them in the background. Um, and then you, you pass in front of that. It's a, it's a Japanese thing, but I can't remember. The little, like, figurine with the arms like that. Right, right, right. And you right. pass in front of it. And, like, then everything, just the screen flashes, and it all turns to, like, blood and decay, and the music changes, and it's, like, really disturbing. And I remember, like, 
Um, it did that didn't frighten me, but I remember being at a kid as a kid being like, "Ooh, like this is hardcore. Like we're really in it now." <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And I stuff, mean, it, oh yeah, it, it, it's it's just interesting, like thinking about the stuff like on the you know the eight bit NES that that was as scary as it could get at the time, like Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street, right at the thirteenth, and uh, but you know, like looking back on it, it's so silly to think that we were maybe afraid of it or uh, that it was you know impactful or, or or that like you said like that I guess this is this is hardcore horror right here um it's so kind of silly in retrospect um there was i don't know if you're familiar with the commodore 64 version of friday the 13th no uh, no is it that wasn't a rare that wasn't rare right because rare rare did the nes one or yeah, not, I don't, sorry I, not friday the 13th that thing in nightmare on elm street yeah yeah i don't i don't remember who did the c64 one um but it was sort of, uh, it was sort of like this free roaming. Not, I mean, the, the world was only so big. I'm guessing it was probably only about nine by nine screens. But, um, but yeah, you just like wander around and uh, and and you would just attack everybody that you saw with whatever weapon you had. And if uh, if they briefly flashed at, in, at, to a character that was wearing different clothes, you know that that was, um, that that was Jason, and you had to, and you had to kill him, right? So you had to attack everybody without killing them. Um, and you have to do it fast because otherwise he'd be walking around killing people. The, the music was so good, and the the, the screech um, that was this uh, obviously digi poorly digitized voice, you know, which is common of the era. Um, it was just it was so impactful, and the music to it, everything. I just remember that being like the the quintessential probably the thirteenth game. And so when I saw the NES one, I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, but I've gone back and played it recently. Uh, the Commodore 64 one. I was like, oh yeah, I can see why this would freak me out as a kid, but as an adult, like there's there's really nothing there. Yeah, I, I feel like as a little kid, because your imagination is so much more just like plugged in all the time, like those abstractions, like your brain automatically populates them with more horrifying things. Where like in um, you know, as an adult, you're just like, you just process the abstraction as an abstraction and just move on with your day. Um, that's interesting. I don't remember any of the Friday the 13th movies involving Jason, like, being in disguise. <laughs> was it just an issue of, like, the graphics were so, there was no way to differentiate, like, they couldn't, they couldn't even depict Jason as different looking than any of the other people. I don't know. Uh, to, to my recollection, that is the only gameplay element, so I think they just had like, this is it. We just have just got to figure out how to how to make a game out of this thing. But all okay. these backgrounds and all these characters wandering around aimlessly. How do we make a an actual game out of this? And right. uh, again, at the time, it was terrifying because like you'd attack you'd attack him and you'd find out it's him and you're like, oh my god, oh now what? It's like <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't think this plan through. <laughs> did Did he fight back when you attack when you attack Jason or like? I think so. Uh, I didn't get very far when I replayed it recently. I just I, the, I played just enough to remember how awesome scary. the music was, and yeah, that's, that's exactly what it was. And I was kind of thinking to myself, I was like, this is like Legend of Zelda esque uh, in terms of like just the you know the, it's like here's the world and just go wherever you want to. Um, but yeah, it was it was all just so random. Um, well, but that, that that's kind of the NES one too, right? Like you're you're wandering around and like you're trying to find where Jay there's like other enemies and things and like but you're trying right. to find items and things and like um ultimately like save people and then like you do have to fight jason at the end right yeah yeah those the, like the house segments like when you actually walk into the house in the nes version and then it suddenly becomes like this sort of over the shoulder perspective and like these horrible sort of like 3d renders of uh, the house it's so we the, the, that house could be four rooms and you'd still get lost because it's just, <laughs> what have, what have i done i've turned myself around so many times um i think that was the real challenge in that game for me it was like, i couldn't figure out how to get around camp crystal lake right because like you'd walk yeah. one way around the map but it would be like didn't correspond to the way that you were actually walking in the map you get to the house and it's it, you know shifted perspectives and i was like oh man like so i don't i don't i don't think i ever uh, got very far on the NES one, or um, or cared to. <laughs> I actually I remembered now when you're talking about seminal horror experiences, and it's not, I guess it's not really something we think of as horror, but it is definitely like I I was reading some list of you know horror movies or horror games the other day, and they had this one grouped in with it, so I guess it counts. 
Um, but I definitely played a lot of the Jaws NES game when I was a kid too. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was it was scary in its own right, I guess, right? You just sort of like you just sailing around and then you hit something and then suddenly <laughs> you're in the water and you're fighting Jaws. <laughs> yeah. Named Jaws, which is adorable. I um I picked up a copy of that. I you know hadn't played it at all since I was a little kid, but I, I picked yeah. up a copy of it um, recently on the NES. And I I have had an NES tune stuck in my head for probably twenty years. And it's like not a bad song, so it doesn't really bother me, but sometimes when I'm just like sitting in the car I'll just hear that. And um, I fired up Jaws. It's it's the harbor scene. Yeah, it's it? it's the yeah it's the, it's the Jaws music. And I was like, oh Jaws. Oh okay, <laughs> that's what it is. And now I don't hear it anymore. <laughs> oh good. Good. Well, one less voice in your head. That Ex exactly. Br yeah. Brings the total yeah. down to double digits. <laughs> <laughs> but. Oh, that's great. That's great, man. Um, I, I I recently played through that with Save States. Oh and, yeah. Uh, which which playing through with save states it is a 14 minute game oh <laughs> like yeah this, yeah it's not long at all yeah um, but i don't think it deserves the crap that it gets i do enjoy what it is uh, i just would be really upset if i was a kid and had paid or my parents had paid 50 dollars for it that's the only problem yeah it's it's one of those games where the figuring out is the part that makes it difficult like once you actually know what to do it's like very easy to get through jaws you just have to like and and get a little bit lucky yeah yeah, I remember being a little bit disappointed when I was like, "Oh my God, is it is it an RPG?" Right? Because you're it's got the top down view, right, and you're yeah. sailing around. I was like, "Oh no, there's just two ports. There's only two places you ever want to go." It's yeah. Back and forth. Um, just kind of since we're kind of laying the groundwork here, Mike. Um, what I, I remember I remember seeing Poltergeist three. Now, I gotta I, I gotta I gotta preface this a little bit. My parents were much smarter than I was when I was a kid. Like, I know most kids that don't think that way, and I probably didn't think that way. But my parents recognized that they had a fragile young boy on their hands and that he should not be watching horror movies right. at, you know, 9, 10, 11, even 12 years old, right? I was way, even at 15, I think I probably shouldn't have been watching movies. And my dad was really strict. He said, he said no PG-13 movies until you're 13. And he actually did the same thing with rated R movies got real upset when he found out that I had watched The Crow, which was uh, a rated R movie. And he yeah. goes, you're only 16 or you're only 15. He goes, this is, you're not allowed to watch it until you're 17. I was like, wow, that's real legalistic. Of like, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised though. So anyway, um, I was at a sleepover in fifth grade and we were watching Poltergeist 3. And I was like, I should not be watching this. My parents would be mad. <laughs> this is also the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Do you remember Poltergeist 3? I've I've never seen any of the Poltergeist movies, actually. <sighs> Mike, you've got some homework, man. I, we, got, we got spooky season coming up. I um, I've, got, I've got friends over on my Discord who we are just constantly feeding each other movies that maybe the other one hasn't seen. And it's just like, and we're just kind of, it's, sept, it's early September when we're recording this. <laughs> like, the second day of September. Uh, it is insane that we're already knee deep in spooky season over there. We're just watching whatever we can get our hands on. We're playing whatever video games we can get our hands on. We are ready for Halloween <laughs> two months ahead of time. So you got to get caught up. Uh, uh, Poltergeist I, 1 and 2 are great. 3 is a much different thing. Yeah, I realize we should have probably scheduled this uh, this recording for like October or something. But I guess with your with your crew, um, it's, it's oh, already yeah. spooky season. It's perfect timing. Yeah. I do have a black cat sitting right off camera. And he's been so. crossing your path like nonstop. I know, I know. She's Does running. it counter it out every other time it happens? Yes, like, exactly. As luck, long as luck. it's as long as bad it's luck. even numbers, you're fine. And there's two okay. of them, so that helps. They they as oh, long geez. as they like <laughs> pass opposite ways. It's good. Every other second you're having bad luck and then yeah. it's okay again. Everything's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um Poltergeist three, Mike. Uh it is it is terrifying. Uh and I've even watched it recently and I was like, Yep, I can see why I was petrified as a kid uh it is the whole thing is about mirrors for the most part okay. and whereas like you see somebody walking down the hallway and you see her also walking down the hallway because this is like you know 80s or whatever and like right. everything there's like full length mirror walls everywhere and so you see the real person walking you see the reflection walking do not slow this scene down because you will notice very quickly those are not mirrors that's just another girl walking <laughs> on the other side of glass um but it was a great effect at the time 
And so, but the like, different stuff is happening in the mirrors than is happening in the real world. You know, like there's like you right. know, creepy dudes looking outside of doors and everything. Right. Dude, this movie made me scared of mirrors for the next decade. <laughs> like it wasn't for the next six months or the next year. It was until I went to college <laughs> that you I was just have terrified. Like, you have like pasta sauce on your face because you can't look in a mirror to wipe it off. <laughs> right. Yeah, dude, absolute insanity. And so, so I mean, that that is um, for me, you know, as much as I, you know, love Maniac Mansion and like other horror adjacent things when I was young, that is like the first real memory I have of just being scared of something that was completely fictitious. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, so like I said, we're just kind of, I feel like we're kind of setting the groundwork here. We're, we're, we're sort of laying the foundation of this conversation. And so I, I uh, do you have memories like that? Is there something that stands out for you? I mean, other than Snow White. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah which wasn't even horror adjacent oh not no 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 those early those early disney movies i've i've been um kind of purging some of my dvd collection lately because i've been get upgrading to blu-rays not because i'm getting rid of things but okay. i've been purging them and so i've been giving away some of my dvds to friends and they so we rewatched some of like the old old disney movies recently and it's like those are they're beautiful to look at, but those are barely movies. Like they're very much just like kind of, there's no characterization or anything. Like the early, early stuff is just like songs and people capering around. But anyway, um, yeah, early, you know, I, I don't, because I, my parents were the same as yours. I was not allowed to watch anything and I was like a super rule follower. So when I was some, any place else where like people were watching horror movies or anything like that, I'd be like, Oh, I can't watch this and like run away or like call my parents <laughs> or something. So it, it's a lot of just like little, um, like clips of things, like snippets of things, which I, I couldn't even really source, but I remember like as a kid, there'd be like some little clip of something that was like really upsetting to me. Um, and so I, I think because of that, again, when you're a little kid, like you always insert um, like your imagination and it's so much yeah. worse. Like when I actually did start watching horror movies, like I assumed horror movies, like, oh, you could do anything. Where like the movies still have a pretty like, firm like set of rules to them like when i finally started watching horror movies you know when i was um you know in my late teens like in high school or going into college it's like oh these are not that bad <laughs> like <laughs> everything that was going on in my head was so much worse wow um, i i don't think i could say the same i think i think horror has always sort of affected me I feel like stronger than most people. Okay, right? it's always it, it's always done the job while I'm watching the movie. Meaning, like I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm holding. I'm in the theater. I'm holding onto the uh, the armrest. You know, like very very tightly, uh, and and I'm just like kind of bracing for impact constantly because I because I think a jump scare is coming. Right. And so okay. there's there's always this anticipation and always like doesn't let me down and. Um, and, and, and there's something about that that is so amazing for me because as a kid, you felt a lot of things. Sure. As a kid, you felt, you know, like love and, and, and things made you feel like cuddly and whatever. And, and you felt, you know, they easily scared or yeah. like the, the wide range of emotions. You felt it all as a kid. And you, usually with like kind of reckless abandon, it was like a little too much. But as I grew up, those other things I feel like didn't, resonate as much and didn't stick around and, and weren't as uh weren't as amplified as horror was you know so like if i watch like a like you know like a, a romantic drama or comedy or something right I'm not, I'm not gonna be like oh good they fell in love and they you know i'm not gonna have that those warm fuzzies but if i watch a horror movie i'm still gonna be really scared that and and, and 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 so like i think it's the people who don't appreciate horror i think are the people who aren't who, you know, kind of lost that fear growing up the way that I lost the ability to love. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, like, yeah, more so than anything else that we've talked about, like that in and of itself sounds genuinely horrific. Like I got older welcome, and I lost all of my, my emotions, but fear. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. terrible. It's, it's not that far from the truth. Like uh, uh, everything else is still there. It's just incredibly dulled from drugs and drinking and old age and like all sorts of you know just regular distractions sure but, dude when i settle into a, a horror movie like 
I let go of all, um, you know, any wall that I've got built up. I just, I just tear that down because I'm like, give it to me. What have you got? Are you gonna, are you here to scare me? Because if that's your goal, if that's your goal during this movie, I am ready for it. Right? I'm just like, target. <laughs> I'll paint target on my chest, like right here. Um, and so, like, so that that's that that's just that's just something special for me. That's like something that just hasn't gone away. Um, and, and luckily, you know, I was just about to say, luckily, I've gotten a little bit more mature as I get older, and um, you know, I'm no longer scared of mirrors. But dude, <laughs> like, scary. like I, you know, I live alone, man. And every so often, something gets in my head, and I'm like, you know, just kind of like keep looking into the other room while I'm trying to sleep. I mean, like, what was that? And I keep looking as if I'm going to see something, and like, what? what's that going to do, right? <laughs> like, right. That, it's better not to not know gonna... that it's coming. <laughs> so much better not to know, right? Because then I'll just be up for the rest of the night. What did I see? Um, and so, like, so I, yeah, that that still exists. I think that, like, that part of my imagination is still very, very active. And, uh, and, and, that's, and I think that's why I love horror so much, even as an adult. Well, so... So tying it back into video games then, so this is this was actually the, the kind of seed that made me think about having this conversation, because we were talking about, you know, horror, survival horror particularly with video games. Right, right. Um, you know, because with, with a movie, there's obviously like a layer of abstraction, you know, like you're, you're, um, you're watching things happen to somebody else. And like you said, like then it gets into your brain and you're like, oh, is there somebody else in, in my room? Or but like you're, you're witnessing it where like with a video game, on some level, like you are experiencing it. Like you are the one in control, like whether characters live or die. Well, I mean, barring story issues, but like <laughs> whether characters live or die is, is up to you. So the fear is kind of a lot more um, I don't know, like like in your face in, in that way. Um, but I feel like that's a very fine, like how, what makes a game scary? Because I don't think it's the same thing as like what makes a movie scary because they are just two different mediums. I mean, so this is what I always say about games especially when you go into a horror game, the scariest thing is that you don't know what the developers are capable of, right? They could be amazingly talented or they could be complete crap and just, you know, <laughs> reusing Unity assets and like moving stuff around the screen. I don't know. Right. Um, and so it's always that moment. It's always that first opening hour of a horror game, for me at least. And I, and I think the opening half hour of a, of a horror movie too kind of like plays by the same rules. You're, you don't know what the makers of this medium that you're watching are capable of. And so you're just sort of waiting to see and like just waiting to see like how far they're gonna push things. And you know, exactly, uh, you know, on top of that, like what kind of movie is this gonna be? Is it gonna be the stuff, is it gonna be about stalkers or is it gonna be about slashers? Or is it gonna be stuff that actually scares me like the paranormal stuff, which funny enough, the paranormal stuff isn't, <laughs> is, I mean, is supposedly real. isn't real. Right, <laughs> like, like slasher stuff doesn't actually get to me all that much. Um, and so when I find out that like, you know, Oh, they've been they've been hearing noises because some dude is like hiding in their walls. I'm like, whatever, right? But if they've been hearing noises because it's a ghost that's haunting their grandfather clock or something. It's like suddenly I'm like, oh crap, not the grandfather clock. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. And so it's all about what they're capable of. And and I and I think it always takes a little bit of time for them to reveal what they are capable of delivering to you as the viewer or the gamer. And 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 once you sort of get a handle on that then it's like then you can start like relaxing and settling in a little bit and just enjoying the ride but until that moment for me i'm just like anything could happen and it's that anything that can happen sure. that really gets to me sure. I, I mean is that is that what you think too or did you have a different perspective well i i guess so i we talked about last episode how i, I just don't really care for survival horror like it's a it's a tough right. it's tough for me to get into that and and i think part of the the reason for that is like like how how you mix the survival and the horror components with that and i think that kind of spreads to every you know every horror video game like not just the survival ones because you know this the scare is that something's going to get you like you're you're going to die um, but that happens in every video game. So like they have to kind of shape it a little bit differently. And then 
Um, so like with survival horror, they, they kick that up by being like, you, you don't have a lot of resources, you're very fragile, like, it, you know, the, the monsters are much more aggressive or much stronger than you are, so you're like, you're at a disadvantage that way. Um, but I feel like, I keep saying it's a fine line, I feel like it's such a fine line because it's, you know, it's, it's scary when, like, the nemesis comes running after you, because it's like, there's nothing you can do about that. Like, it's, it's scary when, um, you know, William Birkin is just, like, chasing you around those, like, sewer tunnels and things, because you're so much weaker than he is. Um, but then, like, and you get killed, and you're like, oh, no! But then, like, like the third or fourth time you get killed, like, it's not yeah. scary anymore. Like, it's just frustrating. So, like, it, it seems it's, to me, somebody, a, a game developer who I knew years ago said a role-playing game is the hardest game to design, and I was like, I, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. Like, for me, I think a survival horror game would be so much harder, because you're trying to gauge, like, how far can we push the player without like them getting frustrated basically like how how yep. scary can we make this before we cross that line into like well it's not scary anymore it's just annoying yeah i, I think i felt that way with um alien isolation because yeah alien isolation was terrifying um you just like never knew where it was going to be it was hopping out events and the, the, yeah. the xenomorph was it just felt like it was sort of everywhere even though there was only one of them uh and so you'd hide under desks and you'd like see the, the yeah. tail go by and stuff and it was just uh really really terrifying uh until you die and then you're like oh well i think that was i think that's the door i need to get to over there <laughs> so you start over here and you go well, let me just see what happens when i beeline it to that right. door and just run like is he gonna is he gonna give me enough time and so after you die a couple of times, I think you start becoming numb to it and, uh, and and sort of being like, okay, well, what's the game design here? Yeah. And, like you start you start seeing through uh, the veil, right? The the veil kind of lifts, and you're like, okay, I see all the mechanics working behind the scenes. Yeah. And so I think trying to figure out how to make how to keep the player terrified and not do the thing that I was doing. Um, have you played any Five Nights at Freddy's games? I. I haven't, because I'm I'm not ten years old. Okay, well, I, so I played Help Wanted one and two because I am, and uh, and also they came to PlayStation VR too. So I, I know a lot about them. The the kid that I used to mentor would would talk about them sometimes. So nice. Well, so somehow those games never got not scary, hmm. even though you would die a lot. Uh, and in VR, the the punishment for failing the mini game is the the jump scare that's like right in your face yeah you can't get away from it it's there like locked to your <laughs> face right so you have to like literally close your eyes which is also terrifying because you're like i just you know uh so <laughs> you're flailing so, and you're like i don't want to hit my polymega <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but apparently the polymega wants to be hit uh -oh. um and so, and so, so somehow the Five Nights at Freddy's games managed to uh, keep the intensity level up even after you failed multiple times. It's not going to be something that works for every game. Right. Uh, and uh, even the examples I gave were the VR versions, right? And so it's easier just to like look away from the screen when you think the attack's coming. Um, but but I, I think there are workarounds, and uh, and that and that became but that did become my problem with Alien Isolation, which was like you know again just a fantastic game at least I thought, and uh, but yeah after once once I get died three or four times in a specific area, I would just try to break the game and just be like all right if I run straight here then right over there and the, it was like okay I, I gave up on the stealth elements yeah uh, pretty much whenever I got even remotely frustrated. Yeah, and, and that's often what I've done with video games, too, like, with with horror games. Like, they'll be scary for that first little bit, but then it's like, eventually, you know, these these things are not getting me in any way. They're getting my avatar, who has to survive, more or less, right. to the end of the game. So, like, it, it starts to, yeah, you, you start to kind of see the Matrix, and it's like, eh, it's not as, it's not as scary now. Um, Which but, is... Don't you think why Maniac Mansion works so well? Because <laughs> if you got caught, like it was, it was very hard to die in that game. Like, right, there were only yeah. like two different instances I think where you could actually die and end up at a, a gravestone in front of the mansion. Um, but you'd get sent to you, you know, Weird Weird Ed or uh, Doctor Fred would uh, take you to the basement, 
Yeah. And then you'd have to like get another character in there. You have to push the brick and get yourself out and boom, boom, boom. You know, you have to go through all these steps. And so like you, you weren't finding yourself in the same situations again and again. There was just sort right. of like this punishment where there was a little bit of forced backtracking. It would take a little time. Um, and I don't think I've seen anything like that for a long time. Like, because dying and then just respawning, you know, three minutes earlier, I don't think that's the right solution. Yeah, I, what you were saying about like it, getting thrown in jail or something like that, it made me think of, um, and I, I, it's not quite the same thing, but a, a game that I found legitimately unsettling. I mean, I wasn't like, oh, jump scare the whole time, but like it definitely had a creepy vibe that kind of got under your skin, um, was Eternal Darkness uh, right. with, with the sanity meter. And like everybody talks about that. And I remember, you know, even at the time, people were like, well, don't you get used to it, though? Like, don't you, you know, like, you know it's coming. Like, you see your sanity low, and then, like, something weird happens. But, like, I, I think what makes it is, well, for one, the, like, because you're changing characters so much, and, like, a lot of them do just legitimately die. Like, horrible things happen to them as part of the story. So, like, in that way, you know, nobody's safe. So if something weird and awful happens, like, maybe it's a sanity effect. Maybe it's just, like, part of the gameplay. Because um, right. there are some things where, like, they said some of the sanity effects are, like, it seems like it's the end of the chapter and your character died, and then it just, like, reboots back to wherever you were. So there's that. And then just the fact that there are so many sanity effects. Like, I played through the game, you know, to get the real ending, you have to go through, like, three times, I think. And, like... Oh, don't ask me. I, I, I was... made it through one time, and I was like, that's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I so I played it three times, and I, and I had also watched another friend, like, play through it before then. So I've seen that game like multiple multiple times and there were still new sanity effects that nice. i was seeing you know ever and and they're in a lot of ways very subtle like um i remember the, the one that i always reference is the um i was playing in a dorm room and there was like a fly on the screen and it's like it's a dirty dorm room so i'm like uh get off the screen you and i get up to like wave it away and like no that was it i was like i can't what the hell where's the fly <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. the, the ones that got me were the ones that were made it seem like there were glitches in the game, right? Your yeah. character, like, runs through the floor, or it looks like the game crashes or something like that. And it's yeah. like, because th this is all stuff that actually happens in regular mm -hmm. video games. And right. so you're like, yeah, I, this this is, you know, you, when you see something like that, you kind of forget almost that you are, you know, that you're playing a game and that you were like, oh, right, that sanity meter could be doing this to me. You're like, your immediate thought is, oh, man, this crappy developers screwed this up <laughs> and they had the t they had the timing down like perfectly too like it was it was so good in that like just when your brain starts to be like hey wait what like then it cuts out and it's like back to regular gameplay so i i think it was just like the volume and the timing was perfect but i i think you were getting at something earlier i think like I don't know, maybe like a really good horror game would be, you know, you're trapped in some castle or something and every time you, you get got, like they just put you to a different part of the castle where you, you haven't been before and you're just like yeah. totally, you know, you're not dead, but you're just like, oh God, now what? Yeah, I mean, video games have gotten so formulaic that it's like that your punishment for failing at a specific segment is always death, yeah. always dying. And is you know at least for horror games i don't i don't think that's the solution um, cuz you know things things tend to, if you if you went to a haunted house right around sure. halloween and not a real haunted house a, a fabricated haunted right. house and you walk through it and then as soon as you cuz this is exactly what they, they they do i do this every year uh, the one the one that's close by i go to and it's like $20 or $30 or something to go through and it's only like 20 minutes and then you and then like, you can go to you can go through this one again for free to kind of get your money's worth or you can travel to any of the other locations and go through theirs for free which is cool yeah. but i'm not going to drive 45 minutes on halloween to go to another 20 minute haunted house um so i just go through again you know usually with friends or whatever and the second time is always less scary because you've just done it yeah because you know and you know what's coming so so dying and restarting a specific area in a horror game it just it, it kills it kills the whole momentum and the vibe of being a horror game it's like well i literally just saw this and unless there's an amazing amount of randomization uh then you're just 
You're just gonna see the same thing you just saw, and, and now and now it's now it's just an obstacle course rather than like this scary experience. Yeah, no, I think I think we're kind of keying in on something like randomization, um, you know, keeping people guessing, that kind of thing. Because yeah, like death, it's uh, it is a little bit lazy because again, comparing them to movies, like death in a for a character in a movie, like that's what's so scary is because you're like, oh no, I you know I don't want this character to die or you know something else horrible to happen to them, you know, because comparing like Alien Isolation to the original film, like. It's, you know, it's super scary when, um, what's his name, the the captain character, uh, is it Hicks, Hicks I don't know the names, or something? Yeah. I just watched it again recently yeah, and I don't They all remember. have, like, very nondescript names when he's, like, down going through the vents with the alien tracker and things, you know, because, like, you, you care about him in some form or another, like, you know, and then spoiler like the alien gets him and then it's like so he's gone and and then you see how destabilizing like the destabilizing effect that that has on the rest of the crew because now this like very you know he was kind of the the stable one the whole time and like now he's gone and so everybody starts like panicking and kind of spiraling a little bit um where like that's not going to function that same way in a game Alien such a good shout, honestly, because it's there's so many things about that movie yeah. that that are absolutely perfect. Um, to uh, uh, I think yeah, I think the most important one is um, that it follows the the monster movie role perfectly of not showing the the monster until halfway through the movie. Right, right. Yeah. You get an idea, you get a whiff of it, you, you see like a shadow or something, but you don't actually right. see the monster, um, so you don't even know what you're scared of until. You know, in, in, until suspense is at is at its peak. Right. Um, but also, it it does something uh, like with the face huggers that makes you go, "Wow!" Like death isn't even like one of the worst things that could happen here, <laughs> right. right? Like, yeah. like this here here's something completely unexpected, especially for the time where he's like, "Man, like you just expect this, uh, you know, the xenomorph to kill you," uh, and then this face hugger comes along and and does something far worse yeah right? you don't know if that person is alive you don't know what's going on and it like how is it even breathing i mean there's so it just it just creates so many questions um let me tell you mike there's, there's an alien vr game coming out in december called rogue incursion and okay. i hope like we are all desperately hoping that this is a great game um <laughs> but there is no way there is no way that's going to capture that vibe from the first movie or even the vibe from alien isolation uh, and I and I really hope I look back on this podcast in like four months and eat my words. But I'm just, I'm more terrified that they're going to screw up this IP than anything else. Yeah, Alien games have a very bumpy record. I mean, yes. Uh, I mean, I think most IPs have a very bumpy record. Uh, but, I mean, there's a lot of great Alien games. Yeah, no, no, that's what I mean. There's like, there's they're either like awesome or they're like, uh, real yeah, garbage yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no i feel you on that um did uh, yeah, I, I was i was gonna i was gonna say we can go down a whole alien path right now and yeah just, like, no. and that that'll be the next hour of the show yeah yeah well i i actually since we're ostensibly retro games um did you ever play um oh god now i'm gonna f aliens infestation the ds one yes yes yeah i mean probably one of the better ones that, that, that right. are out there yeah, yeah, really enjoyed that with all the different characters with different abilities. Yeah, yeah, that that was one that I think, yeah, going into what we were talking about because it it is permanent. Like you have all these characters, and if they die, they're like they're dead, and that's yeah. that's it. You move on without them. Um, did you when you played? Did you if you died? Did you let the character go and just go back and get more or like never? Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I, <laughs> yeah. If there's permadeath, like I will either restart the game load a saved game or i will i'll put down the game and never pick it back up <laughs> like yeah permadeath in a game which, which which listen is kind of contrary to everything we're saying right now right right, right. I, I actually think permadeath is a great mechanic but i just need to be heavily invested in the game that i'm playing and you know with the ds it, the ds is usually something i take with me on vacation yeah uh and so i think like last time i was in san francisco i took it with me and played it in my hotel room and then i was like oh my character died what else do i have <laughs> that's kind of it so I've, I've probably only seen the first couple hours of that oh one. really oh no i yeah. I, I beat it um 
And, uh, yeah, no, but I'm the same way. Like, I was like, well, if I have the power to save these characters, like, I'm not gonna let them go. Like, that seems very cavalier. Like, never mind, like, I, there's that, and then there's, like, the resource hoarding aspect of it, too. Like, I'm, I'm also the type who, in an RPG, like, I won't ever use my, like, full heals or anything until, like, yeah. the last boss fight. Um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I'm a total hoarder when it comes to that. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much the same way. Um, you know, there's Al alien trilogy on PlayStation one mm -hmm. was like really one of the earlier, uh, alien games that I remember being really, really into. Um, but, it, but I think I was, I, I gotta say that game, uh, scared me in the same way that like even earlier games like Wolfenstein 3d and doom did, um, like I, these, these are the kind of games that I remember being like again pretty young, and these they're on the family computer, mm -hmm. right? So they're down like downstairs in the living room, whatever. And so if I wanted to play these in the middle of the night, I had to like sneak downstairs, <laughs> right? Try not to creak as we, I, I went down the stairs, and um, you know start up the computer and and then and then play and 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 it it just it was like this completely different environment where. Uh, it was already a scary atmosphere because like I didn't want to wake my parents up. Right. I probably right. wasn't supposed to be up that late or playing games like, you know, without permission or something. Uh, and then on top of that, it's like, you know, my, the, the 386 or 486 computer is just like not quite pushing, you know, the, the graphics as, as yeah. you know, to the proper frame rate. And it's just all of that combined. And just remember like, you know, like Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein 3D, just hearing one of the guards yell after you open a door was just like, go, oh, Jesus. Yeah. It was a lot, man. It, it was yeah. a whole lot to deal with. And so, um, so I think, I think alien trilogy on PS one, I was like, I was like, I was going to go down that route, but I was like, you know what, as, as like an early first person shooter, I think there are better routes to go down. And, uh, and I, and I think Wolfenstein and doom are, even though they're, they, they're not technically horror game, uh, I think scared me just as much as most horror games uh, of the time. Oh yeah, I mean, if if you're talking games where I've gotten legitimately scared, it's and it's usually that threat of like the loss of progress or something like that. You know, like the 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 Dark Souls and and Bloodborne and all of those games are like full of horrific nightmare monsters, especially Bloodborne. But like none of them scare me so much as the threat of like losing progress. <laughs> <laughs> like. Like, when you've been going for... I, I, I'm trying to think of when the last time was that it happened, but, like, there's there's definitely a couple bits in, like, Elden Ring or something where you have to do some really, like, dicey platforming, and it's it's always, like, right... It's like you've, you've been away from a checkpoint for a long time, and there's, like, some dicey platforming, and then you can get to the next checkpoint, and it's always just like, oh my god, please just help me make this last jump. Like, I don't want to have to do this all over again. I know we're, all, I know we're kind of all over the map right yeah. now, but I've got to ask you, do you consider, um, like, games like Splatterhouse to be horror games? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, okay. they're like, kind of silly, but, like... Like, right. I, well, especially like the first Splatterhouse has a. It's been a while since I played the other two. I played the first one somewhat recently. I replayed it. Um, has like kind of a legitimately unsettling aura about it. Like it's the music is very just kind of droning and like, you know, you're just kind of very slowly marching forward and like hitting things. And then like the bosses are always just. It's it's like a very slow not super hard game until you get to the bosses and then it's just like bah, everything's out of control and your right. move set is so limited that it's like you're just flailing at these things i only ask because we had a we played a game of 20 questions recently um just over on discord and uh splatterhouse was the game that i had in mind i think i was actually talking about the ps3 version specifically okay. and yeah. like um and and somebody said is it a horror game and i was like well is it a horror game if it's not scary and it just happens to be set amongst skeletons and zombies and, you know, things that are trying yeah. to gross you out? Um, and uh, and I guess, so, so I kept saying it was like, you know, it was horror adjacent, um, but 
But then that threw everybody that was playing the game off, and they didn't end up guessing it. And I was like, what happened? They were like, it's, that's definitely a horror game. And I was like, but it's not scary. It didn't scare me at all. I was like, I tried to tell you, you set in a horror universe. And so now my, this is kind of like where my brain has been yeah. going for like quite a while and being like, well, what, what does constitute horror? Um, does it have to be... Does it have to be scary? I saw a thread on Twitter like a year ago that said, you know, to stop criticizing horror movies for not being scary. Like the the movie It Comes at Night, with the A24 movie. Mm-hmm. That is that is a, a movie that is all tone. Yeah. Right? It's just, it sets a tone the entire time, kind of sets up this creepy universe and then does nothing with it. And you're like, well, I think I can criticize horror for not being, it's like if you went to see a comedy and you didn't even giggle once. Yeah, I, I suppose I suppose that's fair. I, I mean, I guess horror kind of has like the it's pulling double duty in a way because, yeah. you know, what scares people is so subjective. Like like what I was saying earlier, you know, as, as sensitive as I was as a kid, like I don't know, it's been quite a long time since I've seen any horror movie that legitimately like scared me. But um, you know, I would definitely consider them horror. I mean, like the I don't know, like, the Evil Dead movies are, like, kind of silly, but I still yeah. would consider them, like, horror. Or, like, Cabin in the Woods, like, the end of that movie is a basically out-and-out comedy, but I would still kind of consider that, like, a horror movie. Yeah. yeah. What about zombie movies? It's, it's all, it's, we're just kind of retreading the same ground, right? <laughs> like, zom- zombie movies, like, are, are in that universe of horror. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But they can be campy, they can be, they can be serious, and they never have to be actually scary, but they, they exist within that world. That, that same kind of, uh, overarching genre. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess tying it back into what you were saying earlier about, like, um, can you still call it a comedy if you don't laugh at all? Like I've I've heard similar people like say, well, I just I just don't laugh a lot at movies. Like I will think things are funny, but I won't laugh. So it's like, you know, in that same way, like if I'm watching some kind of gross out zombie movie where it's just so over the top that like, um, you know, I, I I can't process this as like reality. Like this can't this can't frighten me. Like I'll still be like okay, but I get like this is this is gross and disturbing, you know. Yeah, I mean I I understand, but like I just I think I don't I'm not interested in watching horror if it doesn't scare me. I'm also not interested in watching comedy if it doesn't make me laugh. Like that's why the only comedy I really watch is stand-up comedy because it's like this kind of like raw. Sure. I'm telling you jokes and like it is my job to make you laugh. And if you're not laughing, I haven't done my job. And, uh, and I really, really appreciate stand-up because it's so raw. It's like there's no editing and there's no, you know, there's no acting. It's just I'm telling you a story and it's supposed to be really funny. Ha, ha, ha. Um, and I think that's kind of how I feel about horror as well. It's like so like, over the years I've like, again, I talked about slasher movies and slasher games uh, and zombie movies and games. They're all within the overarching genre that I love. But they're sort of at the bottom. Uh, yeah. You know, if we're putting it on the scale. Um, wait, we really get off track, didn't we? <laughs> it, I mean, that's kind of the, the uh, going back to the spirit of the old without parole episodes, right? Where we'd be like, so how are you doing today? And then like 40 minutes later and you're like, and that's why I think hot dogs are criminal or something. And like, um yeah. Which brings us to Dimension One and Two on the DS, <laughs> which I haven't played. Those look really weird and interesting, but I've, I've never played them. I, I I wish I could play them on literally anything else, to be honest with you, because the control scheme is bonkers, like out of control. Right? They're like, we can make first-person shooters on the DS, and I was like, well, yeah, you if go. you balance the console with one and like, yeah, because I mean. You know the control scheme I'm talking about, right? You're basically yeah, swiping the screen to turn left and right. Yeah, it's like you use the... It's kind of the same as, like, like Kid Icarus did kind of the same thing, right? Like, you're oh, moving man. with the, the nub, yeah. and then you use the stylus to aim. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't... I, I, I think this is somehow even worse, uh, and and, I, and I've, I've committed myself to playing these games on DS, just being like, yes, I'm going to do this now. This is how I'm going to do it. You know, I've got my... Uh, my 2DS XL 
with like the, the the massive screens on it. I was like, this is gonna be great. This is how, it, and like my hand cramps up within yeah. the first hour, uh, which is crazy because those are, I mean, kind of amazing, uh, you know, first person 3D uh, horror games on the DS. Like a, a system not known for its technical prowess yeah. uh, is kind of killing it with those games. Uh, so I've never made it too far into either one, but I, I love what I've seen so far. And, uh, and and would really like just like a, a proper PS5 port or something that just used analog controls because uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get through them otherwise. Who who made those? That wasn't like a those weren't like huge releases, right? Like it was fairly. <laughs> uh, let me check. South Peak. Oh, okay. So are they? Well... It... Yeah, it says South Peak and Renegade Kid. I don't know which one's the publisher and which one's the developer. But, yeah. Yeah, I was but, I was gonna say those were kind of a big deal, but I don't actually know if South Peak is still around anymore. <laughs> they were, right? Um, yeah. Well, but, you got to get the tripod that they use for Kid Icarus, so then you can you don't have to hold the thing. Oh right. Yeah, that is a thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, f I felt like the tripod just kind of like. Yeah, it, it, it was it similar to the Virtual Boy, right? It's like yeah. this isn't. This just feels silly. This is really how this is supposed to be played. Yeah, it's it it solves some problems by introducing new ones. <laughs> exactly. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been going for about fifty minutes, so. I don't know if we want to wrap this one up, and obviously we have not even, we both have very strong opinions about this stuff and lots to say, so maybe this can be like our, our um, we'll just have a spooky season where we just talk about horror for like 10 episodes or something. <laughs> yeah, listen, uh, I'm totally down to, to revisit this next week or whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, scratching the surface, I, I feel like we talked in all my fault uh, we talked just about as much uh, about movies as we did games um, but when you're in the season man I just feel like it's all fair game yeah and it's definitely like video games as as much as you know they have uh, games have obviously broken out as their own artistic genre like for m most of the existence of video games they were heavily 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 inspired by film so I think it's fair to kind of cross talk yeah and if we get into like if we do three or four of these episodes, then uh, <clears throat> then we can talk about VR horror. Oh, <laughs> I right? do. And then and then and then you're really into my specialty specialty. Yeah, field. I was Whatever. when when we were pre preparing for this episode. When I was preparing for this episode, I remembered something that I think you and I had talked about in an old episode of Without Parole, where you were talking about how it was like right when you were getting into VR. And you said mm -hmm. that you still like fall asleep on the couch with the headset on sometimes, and I was like, "That sounds horrifying to me." Because like then you're literally waking up, and this is like the first thing you see, and it's like ah goblins, and like, oh my god. Yeah, um, it's also not comfortable. Like it's, oh you yeah, know, I the, would imagine. The PSVR one and two headset are like you know, especially compared to the competition, uh, are very very comfortable. But they still have a band that goes around your head. So if you're falling back, yeah, you know, yeah. on the uh, on on the sofa, then that thing is pushing into the back of your head, and I was like, oh, that can't be good. Yeah, it's gonna like, and it still weighs a little bit too. It's gonna like pull on your neck, probably depending on how you're sitting. Yeah, I know there are people out there who claim that it's causing uh, them to bald. They're like that it's causing like, oh, baldness I... because it rubs against their uh, their their hairline. I heard like, about that. Yeah, or you're just getting old. Like, in, in losing your hair the way that every person your age loses it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have any... a hard time with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I don't. Oh, no, the thing I heard was that it's, it's um, yeah, no, it was it was something fairly similar to that. But, yeah, I, I think it just, yeah. yeah. It's just Dude, like... my, my vision since I started playing VR has gotten so much worse. Right to the point that no. I have prescription lenses in my VR headset. Really? So, yeah. But 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 again, there are people who are also my age trying to blame VR, and I'm like, nah, dude, we're just forty. <laughs> like this is when things start failing, right? It's like I, I, a little perspective, I think, helps with all of this. Yeah, that's that's a good, yeah. that's a good uh, 
for for all that that should be like plastered onto all video game related YouTube and podcasts and everything. A little perspective goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But hey, and if anybody out there is listening who's losing their hair and blames it on VR, um, stop using VR, man. <laughs> like, like, and see if it grows back. <laughs> and and that and that'll be your answer right there. Because if it doesn't grow back, it wasn't the VR headset. Yeah. Yeah, good, good call. Anyway, um, well, thanks for joining me again. I, I think we'll we'll do another. We definitely have only scratched the surface, so we'll need to talk more about horror over the the coming month. Yeah, um, we didn't even touch on Okaji Spirit King. Oh yeah, <laughs> the <laughs> most terrifying game of all. Duh. Um. So yeah. So until next time, I have been Mike. Still Brian. Yeah, and uh, and we'll see you real soon. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>